In the previous video, we introduced the idea of autoencoders. In this video, we will extend that idea to variational autoencoders. These have a few advantages. They explicitly force the decoder to also decode points that are near the latent representations of our data. It forces the latent distribution to a specific shape, specifically that of the standard normal distribution. And it can be derived from first principles. We can simply start with the maximum likelihood objective, the idea that we want to fit the parameters of our generator network to maximize the likelihood of our data. And from this, through several approximations and simplifications, we can derive the principle of an autoencoder. The basic ingredient that we'll use is the generator network that we introduced at the start of this lecture. Our first insight is that we can view this as a hidden variable model. We have a hidden variable z, which is a standard normally distributed vector, which we feed to a neural network to produce a variable x, which is the data that we actually observe. The probability density function that the network computes for us is the conditional distribution of x given the hidden variable z. Here we see how this perspective can help us to solve mode collapse. If we knew which z was supposed to produce which x, we could feed that z to the network, compute the loss between the output and x, and simply optimize by backpropagation and gradient descent. The problem, as in the previous lecture, is that we don't have the complete data. We don't know the values of z, only the values of x. But if we did, then we would know which output of the network to map to which instance in our data when we compute the loss. The solution, as before, is to introduce a new distribution q, which tells us for a given x, which values of z are most likely. So what would be a good q? For the Gaussian mixture model, for a given choice of parameters for p, we could easily work out the distribution on z conditioned on x, and this gave us a good choice for q. In our case, things aren't so easy. To work out the conditional distribution on z given x under the model p, we would need to invert the neural network. We would need to work out for a particular output x, which input values z are likely to have caused that output. This is not impossible to do, and we saw something similar at the start of the lecture, but it's a costly and imprecise business. As we did with the GANs, it's best to introduce a network that will learn the inversion for us. And this is the network we call Q. It takes as its input x and produces for us a normal distribution on z. It has its own parameters phi, which are not related to the parameters theta of p. And we should think of this neural network as an approximation to the actual conditional distribution on z under p, which is difficult to compute. We now need to figure out a way to train P and Q in concert. We'll try to update the parameters of P to fit the data, and at the same time we'll try to update the parameters of Q to keep it a good approximation to the inversion of P. Now since the parameters of our model are the neural network weights, we will simplify our notation a little bit, and we will rename the parameters theta and phi to W and V, and put them in the subscript. This emphasizes that even though these are probability densities, the conditional probability densities shown here are the only functions that we can efficiently compute. We cannot reverse the conditional, we cannot marginalize anything out. The price we pay for using the power of neural networks is that we are stuck with these functions and have to build an algorithm around just these. With one exception. We do know the marginal distribution on Z, since that is what we defined as the distribution on the input of our generator neural net. It's a simple standard normal distribution. Putting everything together, this is our model. If we feed q v an instance from our data x, we get a normal distribution on the latent space. If we then sample a point z from this distribution and feed it to p, we get a distribution on x. If both of these networks are well trained, they should give us a good reconstruction of x. And with this in hand, we can go back to this composition which we first saw in the previous lecture. Before, z was a discrete hidden variable. The only change is that z is now a continuous variable instead of a discrete variable. That means that q is now a distribution on a continuous space, specifically a normal distribution. But since we expressed everything in terms of expectations on q, the proof still holds. Let's see how this applies to our objective. Ultimately, ultimately, 
we want to train our generator network. That means we want to find weights w such that the sum of the log likelihood of x, summed over all of our instances, is maximized. From our decomposition, we know that the log likelihood of x can be rewritten in this way, where q is a network that we introduce as an approximation to the conditional on z under p, which is a function that is difficult to compute because it would require a network inversion. And the decomposition tells us that if we introduce this q, whatever it is, the likelihood can be decomposed into the KL divergence between Q and P and this function L. In the EM algorithm, we alternated the optimization of these two terms. Here, we ignore the KL term because that is here we ignore the KL term because that is difficult to compute, and we focus simply on the L term. And in the context of variational autoencoders, this is often called the variational lower bound or the evidence lower bound which is abbreviated with the acronym ELBOW. The idea here is that we're trying to maximize the log likelihood, and we know that the KL divergence is always positive, so the function L must be a lower bound on the loss we're trying to maximize. So if we simplify the picture to a one-dimensional model space, we get a log likelihood surface on top of that model space on which we want to find the highest point. This is difficult to compute, but we do have another function L which we know is a lower bound for the likelihood. So if we maximize L, to some extent, we're maximizing the log likelihood as well. Think of this as pushing up on the orange line and indirectly pushing up on the blue line. Exactly how well we do on the blue line depends a lot on how tight the lower bound is. And the distance between the lower bound and the log likelihood is expressed by the KL divergence between P and Q. That is, because we could not easily compute the inverse of p, we introduced an approximation q, and the better this approximation is, the lower the KL divergence, and the tighter the lower bound. So with that, this is now our objective. We introduce a minus to change from a maximization to a minimization objective, so it's easy to implement in machine learning systems, and we simply want to minimize this L function over the parameters v of our encoder and the parameters w of our decoder. So let's start by filling in the definition of L. In the numerator, we see a joint probability which we cannot compute, but we can break this apart into a conditional probability and a marginal probability. This gives us three factors, two of P and one of Q, inside the logarithm and an expectation. We can work these three factors out of the logarithm, making them terms, and then outside of the expectation, giving us three separate expectations. And then we can take the two terms on the right, and take them back into the expectation and back into the logarithm. And if you do that, you'll see that this is equivalent to the KL divergence, but not the KL divergence we had before, but the KL divergence between the distribution that Q puts on our latent space for the input X and the marginal distribution that P puts on the latent space, independent of the input X. And from this, we subtract the expectation, and from this, we subtract the expectation on the log probability density on X, given Z under the model P. And note that these three are the functions that we said before we could compute. Q V Z given X is our encoder network, P W X given Z is our decoder network, and the marginal probability density on Z under P. We noted before we've defined in the definition of our generator network as the standard normal distribution. So filling that in, this becomes our loss function. Let's see with this loss function in hand, what we need to do to implement this in a deep learning system. We'll start with the KL. This is just the KL divergence between the multivariate normal that the encoder produces for X and the standard normal multivariate distribution. This works out as a relatively simple differentiable function of mu and sigma, so we can use it directly in a loss function. We won't go into the details of the working out here, but there's a link in the slide annotations and in the fifth worksheet if you want to see how it's done. For the second term, we need to compute the expectation under Q of the log probability of X given Z. Such an expectation is not easy to work out and certainly not easy to backpropagate through. So instead, we will approximate it. In the simplest way you can approximate an expectation, which is by taking a finite number, L, of samples from the distribution that you're taking the expectation over. In this case, that distribution is Q Z given X. So we take a finite number of samples from that distribution, a finite number of Zs, and we approximate our expectation by averaging the log probabilities over these L samples. And to keep things simple, 
we just take a single sample. We'll be computing the network lots of times during training, so overall we'll be taking lots of samples anyway. So here's what the full network looks like. We feed the encoder an X. This produces a distribution on the latent space. From this distribution, we sample a point Z prime. We feed that to the decoder. We get a probability distribution on our output space X, and we compute the log probability of our data under that distribution. And to get the loss, we sum this final log probability together with the KL divergence between the distribution we get in the middle and the standard normal distribution. This almost gives us a network that we can simply implement in a deep learning system and backpropagate through. The only problem we have left to solve is that in the middle there is this sampling step. We are sampling from a distribution to get this Z prime. And sampling in principle is not a differentiable operation. So we cannot backpropagate through this sampling step to get our gradients for the parameters V. To solve this, we need to look back again to a slide from the previous lecture where we saw how this sampling from a multivariate normal distribution works in practice. We start by sampling a vector from a standard normal distribution, and then we multiply by a, by a transformation matrix A and a translation vector mu, which are derived from the parameters of the distribution that we actually want to sample from. In our case, this trick is particularly easy to apply because we'd said before that our covariance matrix is diagonal. So our network only outputs one variance per dimension and assumes that all dimensions are uncorrelated. In this case, we can sample from the resulting distribution by again sampling a vector x from a standard normal distribution, multiplying this element-wise by the vector of standard deviations sigma that the network produces and adding a mean vector mu. The reason this helps us here is that we can take this whole computation and stick it into our network. So we still sample, but this time we don't sample from a distribution that is parameterized by anything that comes out of our network. We simply sample from the standard normal distribution. We transform that sample by multiplication and addition to very simple and differentiable operations, and thereby we move the sampling step out of our network and we allow a gradient to backpropagate down to the parameters v. We can think of the value E, the sample from our standard normal distribution, as an extra input to our network. And with that, we have a fully differentiable neural network that we can easily implement in a deep learning system like PyTorch. And if we now look at our loss function, and if we now look at our loss function, we see that it has two terms. The first we call the KL loss which pulls the distribution on the latent representation towards the standard normal distribution, and the reconstruction loss, which pulls the output distribution towards one where the input x gets high probability. This formulation of the variational autoencoder essentially has three forces acting on the latent space. The reconstruction loss pulls the latent distribution as much as possible towards a single point that gives the best reconstruction. The bigger the variance on this distribution, the more noise we get from the sampling and the worse our reconstruction will be. Meanwhile, the KL loss pulls the latent distribution towards the standard normal distribution for all points. This acts as a regularizer, pulling the representation towards the origin, but it also means if we do this too much, that all our distributions on the latent space for the various instances will overlap and become indistinguishable to the decoder. And finally, the sampling step ensures that not just a single point returns a good reconstruction, but a whole neighborhood of points does. This way, we don't get a latent space where only a small finite number of points reconstruct to good instances, but we ensure that the whole continuous space reconstructs to things that look like the data. One final step we need to take is to choose the reconstruction loss. What form this takes depends entirely on the output distribution of our generator network. If our generator network, as in our examples, produces a multivariate normal distribution, then as we've seen before, we're essentially minimizing squared errors. Minimization of absolute errors corresponds to a Laplace distribution, and in image settings this often leads to slightly sharper images. And we can also apply the cross entropy between the network output and the target output, and this corresponds to a quite obscure distribution, but it can be justified. And if we're generating images, then this is often the way to guarantee fast convergence. To finish up, let's compare how a variational autoencoder does compared to our original autoencoder. On the left we see the data, in the middle we see the reconstructions of the normal autoencoder, and on the right we see the reconstructions of the variational autoencoder.
there was not much difference despite the fact that the variational autoencoder was derived in a very different manner. Here we see some samples from the generator network, both for the regular autoencoder and the variational autoencoder. And it's hard to tell precisely where the differences are, but in general the VAE tends to produce more lifelike faces. And for the sake of completeness, here's the smile vector experiment for the variational autoencoder. Now we've only used a very small network here for the purposes of clarification, so the generated faces aren't nearly as convincing as those we see for a style gain. With a slightly more elaborate model, we get more convincing results. And here we see some data manipulation for a published autoencoder model. Here's what the algorithm looks like when you implement it in PyTorch. This is taken from the end of the fifth worksheet. The two loops are simple training loops, and the forward pass consists of feeding a batch of images to an encoder, which results in a distribution on the latent space. We compute the KL loss on this distribution and then we sample from it. The resulting sample is fed to the decoder and on the output of the decoder, we compute the reconstruction loss, in this case using binary cross entropy. The final loss consists of the reconstruction loss plus the KL loss and on that loss, we simply backpropagate. In the worksheet, the VAE is trained on MNIST data with a 2D latent space. Here is the original data plotted by their latent coordinates after the VAE has trained. The colors represent the classes to which the VAE did not have access during training. If you run the worksheet yourself, you should end up with a picture just like this. Now, while the added value of the VAE can be a bit difficult to detect in our examples, in other domains it's more clear. Here is an example of interpolation on sentences instead of images. The first shows a regular autoencoder. The starting sentence, I went to the store to buy some groceries and horses are my favorite animal, are two random points in the latent space decoded into sentences. And if we interpolate between these two points, we see that not all of the intermediate points are grammatical sentences. I store to buy some groceries and horses the favorite any animal are not grammatical. It turns out that if you repeat this experiment with a variational autoencoder, and you interpolate between two sentences sampled from the decoder, you can see that every intermediate sentence in the interpolation is also a grammatical sentence. And we'll look at how this model works in a little bit more detail when we get to learning on sequential data in a few lectures from now. So let's look back at what we've learned about deep generative models. We see that GANs are in some ways the inverse of autoencoders. In GANs, the data space is the inside of the network, with two networks on the outside of it, one of which is the inversion of the other. And with VAEs, we have the data space on the outside and the latent space on the inside. But again, we have two networks on either side, with one the inverse of the other. Both of these options allow us to train generator networks and avoid mode collapse. GANs in general work better for images and often poorly in other domains. They're a bit of an ad hoc model and it can be difficult to establish what exactly is being optimized and they're not very good at handling discrete data. VAEs work for a broader set of domains, including language and music, but in general, they tend not to work quite as well on images as GANs. They are derived from first principles. We know that we're training an approximation to the maximum likelihood, and we know exactly how close that approximation is. They allow us a direct mapping from data to latent space that is learned along with the model, but it isn't very easy in a VAE setting to handle discrete latent variables. Another connection that is interesting to consider is that between PCA and VAEs. As we saw before, PCA is also a dimensionality reduction method. PCA is strictly constrained to linear transformations, the benefit of which is that we can derive an analytical solution. And because of the way PCA is constructed, our principal components, the dimensions in our latent space, are often very meaningful and we get an ordering by impact. The first principal component, the first principal component, is more important than the second principal component and so on. VAEs are in some sense more powerful in that they can use nonlinear transformations, but what we give up is that we don't get an analytical solution. We need to train them by gradient descent, which is a more difficult and often more time consuming process. And we don't get latent dimensions that by themselves are meaningful. The only thing that's meaningful in the VAE, if we're lucky, are specific directions in the latent space, but these need not be aligned to the axes. So that's it for generative models. As I said, try the fifth worksheet if you want to play around with this yourself. 
in the next lecture, we'll move away from deep learning and finally have a look at decision trees, how they're trained, and how they can be used to create a very powerful ensemble model.